Hello and welcome to Train Simulator 2014. And it's not even 2014 yet, although we have just like half a week to go. Um, but yeah, this is a fascinating game, the Train Simulator of the future, um, which I thought I'd show you. B because it's it's the sort of game I never expected I'd buy. Um, I'm not into trains apart from they're nice. Um, when they take you places and when they're on time. Um, but when I saw that this game was like 75% off on Steam, I decided to buy it just to try for a few hours and then probably let it gather dust in my games collection. But it turned out driving a train is very fascinating. It teaches you so much about life, about yourself. It is very much an, an inner journey and also teaches you things about geography and culture that you would never have known before. So, um, for example, uh, this route we are on now, which is from Sheerness on the island of Sheppey, uh, off the coast of Kent, to mainland Kent, uh, to Sittingbourne. And this particular route was in fact also a, a deciding factor um, in my decision to uh, to buy this game uh, because although I've never been to the island of Sheppe I've read about it through a website uh, called sheppeyscom.com it doesn't exist anymore but you can find it on on the internet archive which is uh, I, th I think I think I stumbled upon that site like 10 years ago and it was at the time one of the funniest sites um, I accidentally found. It was written by a person who uh, uh, had grown up on the island of Sheppey, had later left and decided to like to share his experiences and, and his view on the island and its people with the rest of the world. It had like several sections, um, like the history of Sheppey, um, places of interest, culture. When you clicked on culture, you were taken to a page that just said no. Just one big no, that's it. And um, as far as I remember, the language section explained a bit about the particulars of the language of Shepi, which is called Shepalese, or rather fuckwit speak. Um, one of its very distinctive features is that it has only one vowel, the letter A. Um, so instead of saying like they do in Kent normally, how are you doing? People of Shebby will say, hi Adang! And instead of saying, oh, I'm doing nothing, they would just say, ah, ah, nothing! And the rest of the site was sort of in the vein that you got the feeling that the person who had grown up in Sheppey later left, he was very, very glad to leave. Um, so here we are. This is the island of Sheppey, digitized in a virtual train simulator. We're driving on it. Our next stop is uh, Queensborough, which is the last town we'll be calling on on Sheppey before we cross over to mainland Kent. As far as I remember from the website, uh, Queensborough was sort of the posh town on Sheppey. Um, meaning mainly that most of its residents had completed primary education. So what's there else to say about the, this train? It's an electric electrical class of... Uh, uh, it has a number. I've forgotten. And yeah, I don't really know any interesting anecdotes about this train, other than it is indeed electrical. 
So here we have Queensborough coming up next. And let's just bring the train gently to a stop. So we can open the doors and let the good people of Sheppey on and off. There we go. And our next stop is um, Swale Platform, which is just on the other side of the um, Swale Strait that separates the island of Sheppey from mainland Kent. What else can we say about this train? It has um, knobs, levers, buttons that do stuff. And uh, oh yeah, two phones. Um, a red phone calling the uh, General Secretary of the Soviet Union and uh, a black phone for calling Satan. Yes indeed. This is a standard issue on all British trains for some reason. I'm not sure if it was intended uh, to have those two direct lines or if, if it was just some Massive cock up at the phone factory. But anyway, true enough, yeah, uh, from British trains you have been able to directly call the General Secretary of one of the two superpowers of the world during the Cold War. Um, not that it, it was ever used, but if it was, I suppose, I suppose it could make a great Hollywood drama. Where, like, yeah, the, the trailer goes something like, In a world gone mad, the only one who can save mankind from nuclear Armageddon is... British rail train driver Reginald Pembleton. And, and, like, the climax is Reginald on the way to Swale platform, struggling to get there on time, while at the same time, having a diplomatic talk with the Soviet General Secretary, trying to convince him to uh, not fire the missiles. Going something like, well, I, I'd like to, uh, if you would not fire the missiles, please. Well, because I don't want everything to be destroyed. Well, because I, I just had my house painted. Well, that's lovely. Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. And, and the thereafter he announces on the intercom that the, the impending nuclear crisis has been averted and that uh, the train will be reaching Swale platform on time. And um, there's that typical Hollywood scene where uh, people, are, people on the train are just hugging each other and a black person is hugging a white person, things like that. Great movie, complete Oscar material. So we are approaching, coming up here in the distance, the bridge over s over the swale. Just a small strait, but in socio-economic terms, a, a chasm that dwarfs the Grand Canyon, I suppose. And going over it right now, it's like leaping over something like the Grand Canyon. Again, in socio-economic cultural terms, making a leap like that on a 
motorbike that's on fire while you're playing a sick guitar solo. This quiet drama is happening right now. And we are now on the mainland. On Swale platform. This may seem like um, just an anonymous platform in the middle of nowhere, but it is in its own quiet way uh, an architectural gem, gem, I think. Very much a, a complete, masterful <laughs> work of um, architectural craft. Or not. So, onward to Kemsley next. So, oh yeah, the black phone um, for calling Satan. Um, the instruction, the general instruction manual for um, um, for British rail train drivers said that the phone should only be used in case uh, the train was stopped and held up by Mexican heavy metal bandits. Because heavy metal bands will do anything Satan says. So you could like call him and have him tell the Mexican heavy metal bandits to knock it off. And the, the robbery would be averted. So was the theory at least. Um, the phone was actually only used once in uh, 1963, I think, when Mexican heavy metal bandits held up a postal train from Glasgow to London. Um, the train driver picked up the phone, as procedure described, but it just turned out that Satan, the dark overlord, was just some confused Geordie guy going like, uh, who are you? Well, what are you calling me for? How do you get this number? And he would have absolutely nothing to do with the robbery or the whole situation and just told everyone to bug off and never call him again. So, uh, yeah, the, the train was actually robbed and uh, it was the biggest Mexican heavy metal bandit robbery on, on UK soil. As far as I remember, one of the um, one of the bandits was called Rodrigo Biges, who later recorded some songs with uh, two of the former members of um, the British Mexican punk band Sex Pistols. Oh yeah, one of the other robbers was Phil Collins. Um, not a lot of people know that. Because when, when he later actually made a, made a movie about his role in the robbery and his later life, um, not only did he, t did he turn down like his involvement with the fact that he was in a, a Mexican heavy metal band, it was completely left out of the movie. That very much surprised me when I saw the movie. I mean, I can understand he would perhaps brush it aside, tone it down a little bit because of his later career as a drummer and genesis, but no, the fact that he completely rewrote history and, and just had the movie portray the, the, the gang as just an ordinary British gang without any Mexican heavy metal element. That's really historical revisionism, I think. And uh, it's not okay. Not okay to just flat out lie about your past. I don't think so. Never had much respect for Phil Collins, I'm, I'm sorry to admit. Right. 
right, so onwards to our last stop, Sittingbourne. So there you have it, a train with the uh, buttons and two uh, phones with a very interesting history. I think we've all learned something today. Twenty mile per hour speed limit coming up shortly. The approach to uh, sitting born is a bit tricky, so uh, better keep quiet and concentrate. This is a very quiet, meditative experience to drive a train, I think. Gives you, gives you lots of time to just ponder about life, and the universe and everything. Oh yeah, that thing, that's um, some uh, awareness system where when the button beeps, well the signal beeps, you have to press a button just to, to let traffic control know that you are alive um, and you are determined to um, drive the train while continuing to be alive. That's about all it does. I mean, I, I would perhaps think it, it, there should be a second button to, to tell traffic control that you love them. I mean, just to tell traffic control that you're alive is just such a sterile, objective message and uh, like calling your parents and say, hello, I'm alive. But calling your parents and telling them you, you, lo you love them, that means something. So, I mean, traffic control should, should know that too once in a while. That's, that's something you realize about life when driving a train, that there are situations in life where it's good to have an I love you button and you should use it more. And here we have the grand station of sitting born central station. Yes, the end of our journey. We'll just come to a stop, open the doors, and say, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, coming along on this journey, and I hope you've, like me, learned something about life in the process. Good night. <laughs>